Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we come to a conclusion of study this day, we thank you for bringing us along so far, but we ask that you continue to push us forward with this information. Um, we need to understand the times in which we leave, live correctly. We need to be prepared for these times. We need to be empowered that we might send this message forth. We ask that you accomplish that in each of our lives. We know that as your people that we are in the Laodicean condition and that we need a, to accomplish a work through your power in order to be those effective witnesses. And we ask that whatever it takes in each of our individual lives, that you make that happen. We give you permission to make that happen. And as we begin this study, we once again ask that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct the words in our in our understanding of the words that are spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. I wish that we had time to really go into the 2520, the the way that a thorough study would do so that you could get some of the impact of how this particular time prophecy connects to these reformatory movements. To me, I think one of the things that the Lord has done with the 2520 here is he's placed it on this chart for the purpose of the fact that at the end of the world, one of the foundational works that will have to take place for the 144,000 is they're going to have to return to the foundations of many generations. They're going to have to return to the ancient tasks of Adventism. And the 2520, if we're correct, and I think we are, that these charts represent the foundational truths of Adventism, the 2520 is a perfect um, tool to awaken Seventh-day Adventists to the fact that they no longer understand the foundational truths. For this reason, it's a, a time prophecy, and every, t every Adventist is familiar with time prophecy. So when you ex take the time to explain the 2520, it's easy for Adventists to follow. It's not complex theology. We understand time prophecies. So it's on the chart. It's easy to understand, and it's easy to show Adventists that they no longer understand these foundational truths. So it's a very nice tool that the Lord put in place, and I, and I haven't defended it, I haven't taken time, as we do in the study of the 2520, to really set it out for you, but I want to I wanna do it one more time to make a point here as we begin. We understand now that there were two 2520s, one against the Northern Kingdom and one against the Southern Kingdom. The one that you see represented by William Miller begins in 677 and ends in 1844, the one that was really set forth well by Hiram Edson begins in 722-23 time period and ends in 1798. Um, and there is a book, we, we emphasize that the Millerite history is to be repeated to the very letter and we refer to a book by Gerhard Damsteed who's a professor at Andrews University and the book is called the the Foundation of Seventh-day Adventist Message and Mission. And it, he uses this book in his course in Andrews as he teaches Millerite history. And if I don't know Damsteed personally, but from what I understand, he's like the last faithful professor at Andrews, and he's a marked man. He, he, so he's sympathetic with foundational truths and, and other important truths in Adventism. And it's a good book, and we, we recommend it. And we recommend it because in that book, even though he's a theologian and he writes it like a theologian, he gives a very detailed point-by-point -point history of the Millerites. And if the Millerite history is going to repeat, then we, we need to understand that history. And he makes a point on page 11 of that book, I believe it is, where he summarizes correctly the basic approach of the Millerites to Bible prophecy. And, and as he's summarizing it, he says that William Miller and the Millerites understood that prophecy was built upon two desolating powers. Paganism, the desolating power outside of the church, followed by papalism, the desolating power inside the church. Every Millerite 
believed this. This was the Millerite approach to Bible prophecy, is that Bible prophecy is structured on the story of these two desolating powers, paganism followed by papalism. So when Hiram Edson is saying that William Miller should have, on this chart, identified the 2520 against the northern kingdom because the northern kingdom was carried into captivity first, the northern kingdom was scattered first, one of Hiram Edson's ar arguments is that when you start the 2520 in 723, when the northern kingdom is carried into captivity, one of his arguments that is very w w sounded, that was very strong to the Millerite idea is so when you have this 2520, you'll notice that the dead center of this is the year 538. So this 2520, it identifies two 1260-year time periods. The first, when paganism tramples down the sanctuary and the host, and the second, when papalism <laughs> tramples down the sanctuary and the host. So, I mean, <laughs> there are nuances. There's understandings of the 2520 that are very, very important to understand. I, I, and, you, and this is easy for you to see, right? This is easy to understand, it, because Adventists, we understand time prophecy. So, so I know that, that you're following the logic of this. And we're not, we're not making points on this. All I'm doing here is trying to stimulate your sanctified curiosity. <clears throat> if you have the Pioneer CD-ROM, and you begin to read the writings of the Pioneers, you will find that the pioneers, when, when, they, when the word scattering is used, the pioneers spoke about the 2520 time prophecy. They spoke about the scattering and the gathering the way that we speak about the Sabbath. It was common understanding. If you use the word the scattering among a bunch of pioneers, they knew that you were identifying the 2520 time prophecy when Israel was being scattered in punishment for breaking the covenant. So it's, it was common knowledge, okay? So with that in mind, let me, let me read you the first paragraph in a chapter from early writings. And remember, the pioneers, when they're talking about the scattering, they knew that at the end of the scattering, the promise was is that the gathering would take place. And this chapter in early writings that begins is called the gathering time. So to a pioneer, to Sister White, they knew that when the title is the gathering time, they know, know that she's repre representing, re referencing the scattering and the gathering. And here's how this, this chapter begins in early writings, page 74. September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people and that efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. In the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn, but now in the gathering time, God will heal and bind up his people. In the scattering, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect, accomplished but little or nothing, but in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. All should be united and zealous in the work. I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to the scattering for examples to govern us now in the gathering. For if God should do no more for us now than he did then, Israel would never be gathered. Now, here's my point about early writings, page 74, in the chapter titled The Gathering Time. And I'm not sure that Sister White picked the title of that chapter but whoever put the book to get, together did, and they all knew it, is that when Sister White was speaking about the scattering and gathering here, every pioneer would automatically know that she's talking about the 2520. That's what the scattering was. Israel was scattered for 2,520 years. If you, go, if you doubt that, that this is accurate, all you have to do is go back to the early pioneer writings uh, on, a, on the Pioneer City Ram and... Type in scattering, type in 2520. So what am I saying? In this opening paragraph, I didn't finish the paragraph. The next sentence after she talks about the scattering and gathering is, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. 
when she endorses this chart and says it's directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered, in the paragraph where she does that, the truth on this chart that she is endorsing more than any other of the truths represented on this chart is the 2520, because that's the scattering and the gathering prophecy. And she knew it. They all knew it. So when it comes to the Millerite history, which we're saying that the Millerite history is repeated here at the end of the world. Unfortunately, we have not had time to deal with the 2520, but we're suggesting that this Millerite history begins in 1798, which is the time of the end. And then in 1833, the Lord formalizes the message of the hour with William Miller. 1798, time of the end, increase of knowledge. Students of prophecy begin to run to and fro in God's word and, and understand the message of the hour. Miller formalizes the message, begins to proclaim the message. And on August 11th, 1840, the message is empowered and a, and a testing time begins. The message empowerment and the testing time is marked by a divine symbol coming down in Revelation 10. Then we see the activities of the enemies of God's people begin in June of 1842 as the Protestant churches close their doors against the message of the hour. This message goes through history until August of 1844 when the midnight cry is fulfilled in the parable of the ten virgins and in history. And the second angel's message is empowered and it reaches its conclusion on October 22nd, 1844 when the door is closed into the holy place and the door is closed in the parable of the ten virgins and judgment begins. And at that point, there's a disappointment and that those Millerites have to understand the Sabbath and on and on in the scenario. But one thing I want to add to this scenario now for us, if you will, is that in this history, we see a 2520 time prophecy coming to a conclusion here and here. There are two 2520s. So in this history, we're seeing the conclusion of the scattering of Israel leading up to the gathering of modern Israel. Okay? That's, that's what I want you to see because we're saying that at the end of the world, because every ref reformatory movement is the same, that for the 144,000, or if we say it this way, this is the history of the beginning of Adventism, and at the end of Adventism, <laughs> we're going to have a repetition of this history that there will be a time of the end that produces an increase of knowledge when a prophecy is unsealed that sheds light upon the upcoming sacred history. A message will be formalized at some point in time, and then there will come a time when this message is empowered, when once again a mighty angel comes down out of heaven, um, and at that point in time also a testing process will begin among Adventism. This way Mark is followed by the activities of the enemies of that message, which we're suggesting is the Sunday law. And at the Sunday law, when the church is purified, we will see the loud cry, paralleling the midnight cry. And it concludes not at the opening of judgment, but at the end of judgment, at which point the seven last plagues will be poured out and there's a disappointment connected with that. Along with that, we should expect to see a scattering coming to a conclusion when God is gathering the 144,000 together. So you can spend more time on that, um, but we're a little bit low on time, but I want to I read you something here. And the reason that that I believe that this is worth putting into the record is because in these sacred histories, 
Isaiah 58, 12 says that God's people at the end of the world are going to raise up the foundations of many generations. And Isaiah 28 and 29 teach that the message in the refreshing time period, in the latter rain time period, is a message that would be conveyed by bringing line upon line. And as we've been bringing line upon line here today, one of the things that we've been identifying is that in this time period of the first way mark, the foundations are laid. And that, therefore, in this history here, when the 144,000 are raised up, there will have to be a returning to the foundations of Adventism. And I'm suggesting that, that, um, that this is taking place at this time and that the, the man that the Lord used to assemble the foundational truths in Adventism also wrote a chapter in early writings. And I think that this chapter in early writings that was written by William Miller is, has a direct bearing to the scattering and gathering that takes place at the end. I know we discussed that, this a little bit last night, but it's worth putting it into the record. This is William Miller's dream. And it says, this is from early writings page 81 through 83. I dreamed that God, by an unseen hand, sent me a curiously wrought casket about 10 inches long by 6 square. 10 by 6 square is 360. Made of ebony and pearls, curiously inlaid. To the casket, there was a key attached. When James White commented on this, he says the key represented the rules of biblical interpretation adopted by William Miller. I think James White is correct on that. I immediately took the key and opened the casket. The casket, in one sense, being the word of God. William Miller is going to open the word of God using the key and and be the man that assembles the foundational truths of Adventism. I immediately took the key and opened the casket when, to my wonder and surprise, I found it filled with all sorts and sizes of jewels, diamonds, precious stones, and gold and silver coin of every dimension and value, beautifully arranged in their several places in the casket. And thus arranged, there reflected a light and glory equaled only to the sun. I thought it was not my duty to enjoy this wonderful sight alone, although my heart was overjoyed at the brilliancy, beauty, and value of its contents. I therefore placed it on a center table in my room and gave out word that all who had a desire might come and see the most glorious and brilliant sight ever seen by a man in this life. William Miller formalizes the message. He places the box on the casket, says, come and see. This, is, this isn't just for me. This message is for anyone that wants to see it. The people began to come in, at first a few in number, but increasing to a crowd. When they first looked into the casket, they would wonder and shout for joy. But when the spectators increased everyone would begin to trouble the jewels, taking them out of the casket and scattering upon them upon the table. Traditionally, the, those that relate to the William Miller's dream in Adventism suggest that the jewels in William Miller's dream are, are God's people, because God's people are going to be jewels in the crown. And, but what is a lion in Bible prophecy? What's a lion in Bible prophecy? Depends on context. The lion can be Babylon. The lion can be Satan. The lion can be Christ. The lion can be Judah. So you have to determine a symbol by the context. And I don't disagree that jewels can represent God's people, but there are several passages in the Spirit of Prophecy where Sister White identifies the jewels as the truths of God's Word. In Christian Education, page 86, she says, "...the jewels of truth lie scattered over the field of revelation." but they have been buried beneath human traditions, beneath the sayings and commandments of, of men, and the wisdom from heaven has been practically ignored. Satan has succeeded in, in making the world believe that the words and achievement of men are of great consequence. They are vain, there are veins of truth yet to be discovered, but spiritual things are spiritually discerned. One passage of scripture will prove a key to unlock other passages, and in this way, light is shed upon the hidden meaning of the word. By comparing different texts, treating on the same subject, viewing their bearing on every side, the true meanings of Scripture will be made evident. 
So to suggest that the jewels of William Miller dreams are the truths of God's word is consistent with what jewels can represent in Bible prophecy. And I'm simply saying that the traditional view of what the jewels are in William Miller that has come down through Adventism for the last 160 years is incorrect. That in this passage, it isn't God's people. It's the truths of God's word that William Miller assembled, the foundational truths. It says, <clears throat> when the spectators increased, everyone would begin to trouble the jewels, taking them out of the casket and scattering them on the table. I began to think that the owner would require the casket and the jewels again at my hand, and if I suffered them to be scattered, I could never place them in their places in the casket again as before, and I felt I should never be able to meet the accountability, for it would be immense. I then pleaded with the people not to handle them or take them out of the casket, but the more I pleaded, the more they scattered. Now they seemed to scatter them all over the room on the floor and on every piece of furniture in the room. I then saw that among the genuine jewels and coins, they had scattered an innumerable quantity of spurious jewels and counterfeit coin. Are there any false doctrines taught in Adventism today? I was highly incensed at their base conduct and ingratitude and reproved and reproached them for it, but the more I reproved, the more they scattered the spurious jewels and false coin among the genuine I then became vexed in my physical spirit and soul and began to use physical force to push them out of the room. But while I was pushing one out, three more would enter and bring in dirt and shavings and sand and all manner of rubbish until they covered every one of the true jewels, diamonds and coins, which were all excluded from sight. They were sealed up, brothers and sisters. The foundational truths were sealed up. They also tore in pieces my casket and scattered it among the rubbish. I thought no man regarded my sorrow or anger. I became wholly discouraged and disheartened and sat down and wept. And brothers and sisters, in 1798, the line of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5 began to unseal the Bible. We talked about that last night. But he only did it after John wept much. John wept much. Then the prophetic message of Daniel began to be unsealed. And here we see William Miller reaching a point to where these truths are buried up and covered with rubbish and he realizes he can't do anything but cry. And then it says, While I was thus weeping and mourning for my great loss and accountability, I remembered God and earnestly prayed that he would send me help. Immediately the door opened and a man entered the room. When, when the people all left it, he and he, having a dirt brush in his hand, opened the windows and began to brush the dirt and rubbish from the room. Sister White says the dirt brush man is Christ, the same way that she says the lion of the tribe of Judah that unseals the book that's sealed with seven seals is Christ. I cried for him to forbear, for there were some precious jewels scattered among the rubbish. He told me to fear not. And who is it that says fear not? Christ that it says fear not. He told me to fear not, for he would take care of them. Then while he brushed the dirt and rubbish and false jewels and counterfeit coin, all rose and went out the window like a cloud, and the wind carried them away. In the bustle, I closed my eyes for a moment. When I opened them, the rubbish was all gone. The precious jewels, the diamonds, the gold and silver coins lay scattered in profusion all over the room. He then placed on the table a casket much larger and more beautiful than the former. And brothers and sisters, the first casket in one sense represented the word of God. In one sense, it represented the year-day principle. But here, when the, the foundational truths are going to be put back together, the casket that represents the word of God is bigger because here at the end of the world, we have not only the Bible, but we have the spirit of prophecy. It's larger. He then placed on the table a casket much larger and more beautiful than the former and gathered up the jewels, the diamonds, the coins by the handful and cast them into the casket till not one was left, although some of the diamonds were not bigger than the point of, the, of a pin. He then called upon me to come and see. I looked into the casket, but my eyes were dazzled with the sight. They shone with ten times their former glory. I thought they had been scoured in the sand by the feet of those wicked persons who had scattered and trod them in the dust. They were arranged in beautiful order in the casket, every one in its place, without any visible pains of the man who cast them in. I shouted with very joy, and that shout awoke me. And who is it that awake, wakes up and shouts? It's 
the midnight cry in the parable of the ten virgins, all the virgins slept, but at midnight a cry comes and they wake up and the parable of the ten virgins has been fulfilled to the very letter in the Millerite history, but it's to be fulfilled again to the very letter according to the spirit of prophecy when the parable of the ten virgins is repeated in our day and age. And here Miller is talking about the wake up that takes place in the loud cry. And therefore, when you're looking at these repetitions of these reformatory histories, there is a scattering that takes place in Adventism over the past 160 years. But this scattering is the scattering of the foundational truths of Adventism. And when Isaiah 58, 12 says one of the works that the 144,000 accomplish is they return to the ancient past, the old ways, and they are the, they that raise up the foundations of many generations. They do that by bringing line upon line and recognizing that every reformatory movement parallels all the reformatory movements and that the foundations are laid right here at the at the start, and therefore the truths that the Lord put together by William Miller are absolutely rock solid. Amen. We must maintain those foundational truths if we're going to participate in bringing the jewels of truth into alignment with the Millerite message at the end of the world, because that's what happens. There's going to be new light that comes at the end that is based, built upon the, the old light that was established in the Millerite time period. Manuscript releases, volume 13, page 334 says, I stated that I was a stockholder and I could not let this resolution pass, that there was to be special light for God's people as they neared the closing scenes of this earth's history. Another angel was to come from heaven with a message, and the whole earth was to be lightened with his glory. It would be impossible for us to state just how this additional light would come. It might come in a very unexpected manner, in a way that would not agree with the ideas that many have conceived. It is not at all unlikely or contrary to the ways and works of God to send light to his people in unexpected ways. When it comes to Revelation 18, we have been told that there was going to be light that comes from Revelation 18 and the inferences. It's going to come in a way that we don't expect and it's going to be a, a, a light, a truth about Revelation 18 that we haven't thought about. That's how I understand that passage. <clears throat> now, a couple, a couple thoughts about um, about the messages, the, the three angels' messages. The select message, book 2, 1, 16 says, Thus the substance of the second angel's message is again to be given to the world by that other angel who lightens the earth with his glory. These messages all blend in one to come before the people in the closing days of this earth's history. All the world will be tested. And all that have been in darkness of error in regard to the Sabbath of the fourth commandment will understand the last message of mercy that is to be given to men. So the messages are all going to blend into one. Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 949 says, The great message combining the first, second, and third angel's message is to be given to the world. There's a way... There's a way to blend these messages. There's a way to combine these messages. She goes on to say in this quote, this is to be the burden of our work. The whole, this is Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, page 40. The whole earth is to be lightened with the glory of the Lord. The pure in heart shall see God. It is those who are following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth that will receive power from that angel that came down from heaven having great power. The first message is to be repeated, proclaiming the second advent of our Christ to the world. Advent of Christ to our world. The second angel's message is to be repeated. She's plainly saying this isn't the only place she says it, that the first and second angel's message is to be repeated. And generally, I think when we read that, we think, well, okay, we're going to have to teach, teach new believers the, the, the content, the theological content of the first and second angel's message, just like we had to learn it when we were baptized, baptized into Adventism, and that's true. But it, it can also be understood that the experience 
what took place in the first and second angel's message is to be repeated. And I, I think that's the primary emphasis on here is that the Millerite history is going to be repeated. I've already read a couple quotes where Sister White says the angels of Revelation 18 r- represents the work that the people of God are to do. Um, I have a, this is a bit, uh, maybe we'll get to that. There's another argument to put in place, but it's a little bit complex. I'm going to pass over this and go to probably the most, the quote that is the point of reference for this study here in the last 30 minutes. This is from 1888 Materials, page 804. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy, and their work is not to cease till the close of this earth's history. The first and second angels' messages are still truth for this time and are to run parallel with this which follows. Sister White says, the first and second angels' messages are still truth and they're to run parallel with that which follows. What follows the first and second angels' message? So the third angels' message is to run parallel with that which follows. Now, we've already pointed out here purposely, tried to make this point so we could all see it easily when we reached this quote. The first angel's message is formalized by William Miller, and it goes through history until it's empowered. The second angel's message arrives in June of 1842, and it goes through history until it's empowered. The third angel's message arrives in history in 1844, and it goes through history until it's empowered. And it's empowered when the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins it. Everyone understand that? So if that which follows the first and second angel's message, which is the third angel's message, is to run parallel with it, then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the third angel's message here and I'm going to bring it right down here. Okay? In 1844, October 22nd, 1844, the third angel's message arrived in history. It's going to go through history until it's empowered. And we know as Seventh-day Adventists that it's empowered when the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins it. And when the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins it, he comes down out of heaven and the earth is lightened with his glory. And when the first angel's message was empowered, the angel of Revelation 10 came down and put his foot upon the land and the foot upon the sea, representing a worldwide message. Empowerment, worldwide empowerment, worldwide earth lightened with his glory. Okay, you see see the, the comparison. So the third angel's message, empowered the same way, it's to run parallel with that which follows. Second angel's message, fulfilled in the USA, we're saying the second way mark down here is the Sunday law in the United States. Let's look at a, uh, I'm a quote here. Um, This is Early Writings, page 277. And there's a a very interesting argument that that you can make at this point that helps helps understand this sequence, but it's hard to see if you... I believe that it's hard to, to convey unless those that are listening have the quote right in front of them. So I'm passing over it, but... Maybe we'll get back to it, but I want to read one of the quotes that is involved with that argument because there's something that's very simple to add to this. Early Writings, page 277. Let's do the whole argument. Let's start in Early Writings, page 245. This is the hard one to do to you at the end of the day when your mind's already way overwhelmed, but we're going to give it a shot, all right? So let me, let me try walking us through this. She's going to talk about this history, the first and second angels' messages, all right? She's going to to teach something in a very sort of behind-the-scenes way, or 
Anyway, I was shown the interest which all heaven had taken in the work going on upon earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel. This is the first angel. You'll see it by the context. And the first angel is singular. It is a mighty angel, singular, to descend with and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second appearing. As the angel left, left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. I, told, I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory. Now, catch that. If you read this in context, she's talking about the first angel's message, and she's saying the work of the first angel's message is to lighten the earth with his glory. But we know that the angel of Revelation 18 is the one that lightens the earth with his glory. So she's comparing the first angel's message here with the, angel, the fourth angel's message, which is, which is correct. I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and to warn men of the coming wrath of God. Multitudes received the light. Another mighty angel, this is the second angel, another mighty angel, singular, was commissioned to descend to the earth. Jesus placed in his hand a writing as he came to earth. He cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. As the people of God united in the cry of the second angel, the heavenly host marked with deep, deepest interest the effect of the message. D Jesus commissioned other angels, plural, to fly quickly and revive and strengthen the drooping faith of his people and to prepare them to understand the message of the second angel and the important move which was soon to be made in heaven. I saw these angels receive great power and light from Jesus and fly quickly to the earth to fulfill their commission to aid the second angel in his work. A great light shone upon the people of God as these angels, plural, cried, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. So here's my point. And Sister White's talking about the history of the first, second angels. She, saw, she calls the first angel singular, the second angel singular, but the midnight cry, that's a group of angels, all right? And we're saying that this history is repeated, and we're going to see that when Sister White talks about the repetition of this history, she's going to do the same thing. She's going to describe a singular angel, a singular angel, and then a group of angels that are representing the loud cry. And that's a little bit hard, I believe, to see without having the quote in front of your hands, but there's another point that I'm going to make in this next quote along with that. This is Early Writings 277. How many of you have I lost? Okay. Now she's talking about something different. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to the earth and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another mighty angel, singular, commissioned to descend to the earth, and unite his voice with the, first angel, with the third angel, singular. Singular, singular. Okay? Singular, singular. This is the history of Revelation 18. Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth, unite his voice with the third angel, and give power and force, force to his message. Great glory... Power and glory were imparted to the angel, and as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. The light which attended this angel, singular, penetrated everywhere as he, singular, cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The message of the fall of Babylon is given by the second angel is, to be repeat, is repeated with the additional mentions of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel, singular, comes in at the right time to join in the last work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation which they are soon to meet. I saw great light resting upon them, and they united in to fearlessly proclaim the third angel's message. Now notice this. Angels, plural, were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven. The third angel, singular. Revelation 18, verse 1 through 3, the angel that comes down and lightens the earth with his glory and joins the third angel, singular. Now she's going to talk about a group of angels. Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices, plural, which seemed to sound everywhere, come out over my people. This is Revelation 18, verse 4. This is the other voice. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues, for her, mess, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. 
Now notice what she says about this message of verse 4 of Revelation 18, the other voice of Revelation 18. She says, this message seemed to be in addition to the third message, joining it as the midnight cry, joined the second angel's message in 1844. The glory of God rested upon the patient waiting saints, and they fearlessly gave the last solemn pro- pro- warning, proclaiming the fall of Babylon and calling God's people out to come out of her that he, they might escape her doom. It's the same history. It runs parallel. The first angel's message was singular. The third angel's message down here is singular. The second angel's message was singular. Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, the mighty angel that comes down out of heaven and the earth is lightened with his glory is singular. The midnight cry was a group of angels. The loud cry, come out of her, my people, is a group of angels. So when I'm suggesting to you the Revelation 18, the work of Revelation 18, and that's what angels represent, Sister White says, is the work of the people of God, that what we call the fourth angel's message in Adventism, which is okay, we need to understand that what's being described is a two-step work, because this work is paralleling this two-step work. That which follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. And this history was a two-step work. So, what I'm saying is that it is at the Sunday law in the United States that the call come out of her, my people, goes forth, and that this is Revelation 18, verse 4. Maranatha, page 173, says this. Revelation 18 points to a time when as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and it will accomplish its work. When those that believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusions and to believe the lie, then... The light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it. And all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call. Come out of her, my people. Now, brothers and sisters, she's saying that the call come out of her, my people, and she's quoting Revelation 18, verse 4, takes place when those of us in Adventism that believe not the truth, but had pleasure in in righteousness, are left to receive strong delusion. And you can show from a prophetic study very easily that Seventh-day Adventists that are going to receive the strong delusion that it takes place at the Sunday Law test. And this is where the call come out of her, my people, takes place. And at the Sunday Law test, in terms of the parable of the ten virgins, the door closes for Adventism. The door in the parable closes. And the door in the parable for the Billerites closed at this test. And that is where 49,950, according to the historians, Millerites continued to pray to the holy place and Satan answered their prayers. And it corresponds to the repetition of the parable of the ten virgins in our day and age at the Sunday Law test, when the majority of Seventh-day Adventists are going to receive strong delusion, and that corresponds to the same testing process in the time of Christ, when those Jews that did not accept the progressive message that began with John the Baptist ended up being left in perfect darkness, according to Sister White. So what I'm saying is, That which follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. And in Signs of the Times, November 8th, 1899, it says, None are contemned until they have had light and have seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast of, and his image. The line will be clearly drawn between the false and the truth. True. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. The call to come out of her is the Sunday law in the United States. So what, what is the, where do we go from here? 
Now, <clears throat> now we will begin to consider a couple things about the repetition of this history. We'll, and we'll cover them in a very, we only have 10 minutes left, roughly. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you an overview of some of the things that we're going to put forth, in a, hopefully, in a very clear, concise fashion tomorrow. First off, we've read a quote here in this presentation where Sister White says, there's, implies there's going to be new light about Revelation 18 that's going to come in a way that we don't expect. And when it comes to these foundational truths, as I've said before, but it's worth, I believe it's worth saying again, if you read what the pioneers understood about the trumpets of Revelation, they understood that the trumpets represented the historical forces that brought down Rome. That was, that was the first thing they were going to tell a person about the trumpets. These are the powers that bring down Rome. Read Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. Read uh, The Seer of Patmos by Haskell. You will see the pioneer. Read The Seven Trumpets by James White. You will see the pioneer understanding of the trumpets. And they will always tell you that these are the forces that bring down Rome. The first four trumpets bring Western Rome to a conclusion by 427. The fifth trumpet leads to the end of Eastern Rome by 1453. And in the sixth trumpet, Papal Rome comes to a conclusion in 1798. So the pioneers understood that the seven trumpets were, were the providential forces that were against Rome, not under the control of Rome. And it is from an, a prophecy in the sixth trumpet, which is also the second woe, it's from that prophecy that the Millerite message is empowered. Okay, the time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days is a time prophecy that's in the second row of the sixth trumpet. So when I'm saying to you that the Millerite history is going to be repeated, I also want to add to that thought that if it was a message from the trumpets, a message from the woe trumpets that empowered the Millerite message and the Millerite history is going to be repeated at the end of the world, then it is not a stretch of, lo stretch of logic, sanctified logic, to say that the prophecy that has been designed by God to empower the final warning message will be a woe trumpet message. And what we're going to begin to share with you from here on is that on September 11th, 2001, the third woe arrived in history and the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down. And we're going to do that by using the history of the Millerites as the point of reference to identify the unfolding history of the 144,000. There's usually at this point someone that has already interrupted. <laughs> Nobody's interrupted. It's been a long day, all right? And I don't mean interrupted in a negative way. I'm saying at this point... There's usually a thought in someone's mind, so I'm assuming it's out there, but you just don't have the strength to ask the question. <laughs> yes? Okay, but that wasn't the question I was hoping for. I have a question that, that, I, that I'm going to state because we have little time and I want to keep on track. The first four trumpets were the historical forces that brought down Western Rome by 427. When Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, Constantinople in the year 330, Rome was divided into East and West. Seventh-day Adventists need to understand this. Rome was divided into East and West. And when Papal Rome inherited the former Roman Empire, it inherited an empire that was divided into east and west. We need to understand that today because there were two forces that bring down east and west. What brought down eastern Rome was Islam of the sixth trumpet, the second woe. But what brought, brought down the support of western Rome is another power, and we'll deal with that later. So 
The first six trumpets were powers that brought down Eastern Rome, Western Rome, and Papal Rome. And the, the, the logic is, is that the seventh trumpet, the third woe, are the historical forces that will bring down modern Rome. Modern Rome being the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Now, some people may immediately say, and you're correct, isn't it the ten kings that burn Rome with fire and eat her flesh? Yes, it is. But we, <laughs> we'll show you how... Islam is still in there too. The question that is normally asked at this time that no one has asked yet that I'm going to ask for us. <laughs> when this history is repeated, what's the time of the end? There's always a time of the end. All day long we're saying that these reformatory movements have a time of the end and we need to at least put this in place. Okay? Right? If they're all the same, they've all had a time of the end, shouldn't there be a time of the end when the most important reformatory movement takes place, right? Pardon me? No, 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 not 1844. And I'll tell you why not 1844. The time, why I understand it's not 1844. The time of the end is a fulfillment of a prophecy. And with the fulfillment of that prophecy, there is light shed upon the upcoming sacred history. Now, since... Since 1844, I don't deny that we've been in the history of the third angel's message, but what I'm saying is what God, when God begins to accomplish the final Reformation time period, there will be a fulfillment of prophecy that marks for the students of prophecy that are running to and fro in the Word that this final history is beginning to develop. And this final history is the history, not pointing forward to the future rival of the third angel's message. This is the history of the mark of the beast. It's the history where the United States places the papacy on the throne of the earth. And in 1989, in fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 40, the Soviet Union was brought down by an alliance between the United States and the Vatican, and the first of the three obstacles for modern Rome to conquer as it returned to the throne of the earth was accomplished and the time of the end arrived. And at that point, this history of the return of the papacy to the throne of the earth through the work of the United States began to take place. Daniel 11, verse 40, is the fulfillment of that prophecy. You know what blows my mind, brothers and sisters? You know what blows my mind about this? Is in verse 40 of Daniel 11, it begins like this. It says, and in the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. The time of the end for the Millerites is 1798, and it's identified in Daniel 11, verse 40. And the conclusion of Daniel 11, verse 40, identifies the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. It also marks the time of the end for the 144,000 in one verse. And there begins to be an increase of knowledge on this subject, and the third angel's message moves through history, heading towards its empowerment. Now, brothers and sisters, in the Millerite movement, the fulfillment of, of a prophecy on August 11th, 1840, is what empowered their message, confirming the year-day principle. I hope that we're all familiar with this prof prophecy, but perhaps we aren't. If you go to Revelation 9, <coughs> saying... Verse 14, it, say, it says, saying to the sixth angel, the sixth angel, the sixth trumpet, which is the second woe, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for, us, for to slay a third part of men. The third part of men that they slayed was Eastern Rome. Um, Rome's divided into three parts in a variety of ways. And in 1453, Islam brought to a conclusion Eastern Rome, a third part of men were slain. But there are four angels that are prepared for this time period, and the pioneers of Adventism had a clear understanding of these four angels. You can see these dates I'm referring to right here on these charts. And they will tell you Take Uriah Smith, take Haskell. The pioneer position is that what brings this prophecy to a conclusion 
is that after 391 years and 15 days of warfare that was brought against the Europeans by the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire in Turkey was called the, the weak man of the East. It was, it was powerless, but there was an Islamic country called Egypt that wanted to reestablish the Islamic dynasty and continue the warfare against Europe. And Egypt, in order to do that, attacked Turkey, the weak man of the East, even captured its navy. And the Europeans looked at this situation and said, we've had hundreds of years of this warfare of Islam. We need to do something about it. And on August 11th, 1840, Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, surrendered its national sovereignty to the four great European powers. And it was that event that marked the conclusion of this time prophecy. And what happened in, this, in a prophetic way is that on August 11th, 1840, the four great powers of Europe, and four can be understood as worldwide in Bible prophecy, the four great powers of Europe came together to decide the fate of Islam and put a restraint on Islam, and they did so. And our first argument here, and we have many more arguments tomorrow, is that on September 11th, 2001, George Bush went to the world and said, we are now in a worldwide war with Islam. You're either for us or against us. And at this point, the entire world came together to decide the fate of Islam and put a restraint on Islam. And this action is paralleling the action of the four great European powers, the four great European powers pointing forward to a worldwide event when Islam is restrained. We have several other arguments about the role of Islam and Bible prophecy to bring. We're just, just starting down this road. And we don't have enough time to take up even one more this evening, but I want to tell you something. A, a backwards way to try to stimulate your sanctified curiosity along this line to get you back here tomorrow to hear this, if, if I can, and it's this. I, and I've said this once before, but you don't un understand how real this is and how often it's happened on this subject of Islam and Bible prophecy. I've had men that are understood to be proficient in God's word say, well, you can't listen to Pippinger on this subject even though what he's saying is true. Okay? <laughs> We've got to record it. And the point is, is that you need to hear these arguments because even the, the arguments that are being brought against this are so out and left field that it demands that you investigate what we're just beginning to say because if this is true, on September 11, 2001, there's a worldwide event marking when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down. And that means, among other things, there's a testing process that has begun in Adventism that parallels the testing process of 1840. I'll go one step further. This marks the beginning of the sealing of the 144,000. And if this is true, there is no excuse for not hearing this message now because time is running out. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, it's, appears, it seems easy to see that you are now sweeping the rubbish Amen. out of Adventism and regathering the, the foundational truths and bringing them together into a, a message that is ten times brighter than what the Millerites possess. But we're worn down with the experience of living in Laodicea. We're worn down with our own bad habits. And we're worn down with all the false doctrines, all the winds of doctrines that are born, blowing through Adventism, and we are, we're unsure about stepping too far off onto new, new ideas. So we ask that your Holy Spirit, uh, this evening in our, in our moments of thought, in our resting time, that your Holy Spirit would convict us 
of whether or not we should be here tomorrow to hear the, the information. And if, if we should, we ask that you would open the doors that we can come back and hear this information. And if, if this information is correct, we wish to know it. If it's incorrect, we wish that you would clearly um, identify that as well. We want to be among those people that go through the testing process of the ceiling of the 144,000 on the right side of the issue. We do not want to be those that receive the strong delusion because we do not have a love for the truth. Lord, I pray that you will protect us all and bring us back here tomorrow and that we can bring um, the subject of Islam into a clear focus for all of us so that we can better understand what's going on in Earth's history at this time. We thank you for a blessed Sabbath day. Um, and we ask that you would use this day as a point of reference for, for all of us where you began a revival in each of our lives that woke us up to be among those number that meet you and each other again on the sea of glass very soon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>